Okay, everyone. Um, today, it's our pleasure to welcome Jim Freudenberg from the University of Michigan, who is a professor in uh, control in ECS at Michigan. Um, and he, um, he works in a number of areas related to control and design and design limitations. Um, and I think the focus of today's, and internal model principle, but the focus of today's uh, lecture is going to be on um, uh, the uh, course design and the research projects that have come out of a course that he's responsible for designing at the University of Michigan on embedded control systems. And then um, also simultaneously teaching a version of this course at ETH in Zurich for 12 years. Every September, a two-week intense version of this course. Um, and so, um, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing about this. Um, welcome, Jim. It's a pleasure that you're here. Okay, thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you. And uh, boy, I've really had a good time last night at uh, social events, and I've I hope I don't lose my voice because I've been talking to people all day, old friends, and I made a few new ones, and I really like it. So um, I want to talk a little bit about a class that I created at Michigan and in response to a demand from industry and that has kind of grown to take over my life. Um, but um, um, it's had some spin-off research projects, and we have a relatively new research grant that we don't have a whole lot of results yet, and I'll show you a few of those at the end, but then I'll tell you the story about the connection between the class and the, and the research projects and where we hope to go from there. Um, I'm going to give my acknowledgments first. There's three people that have helped me really a lot. Uh, Jeff Cook, who managed a uh, powertrain software control group at Ford for many years, and now he teaches at Michigan. Noah Cowan, who was a... Um, PhD student at Michigan, not from me, for Dan Kodachek. Came out here to Berkeley and did a postdoc with Bob Full. And he's been teaching at Johns Hopkins ever since. There's a lot of Berkeley connections in this talk. So if I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to make them. And Brent Gillespie, who's my colleague in mechanical engineering that designs haptic interfaces that you'll hear a lot about. Uh, our previous PhD student, Bo Yu, uh, who's graduated a few years ago, our current PhD student, Stephen Cutlip, I don't have photographs for them. Thousands of students that have taken this embedded control class and the NSF funding agencies that have provided us with grants over the years. Um, our current grant is me, Noah Brent, and Amy Bastian at the uh, Johns Hopkins and the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore. So automotive software is really in the news a lot these days. And in case you're wondering, that's um, Toyota, Tesla, the cars of Volvo, but the damage is Uber, and somebody hacked a can bus on a Jeep Cherokee. Um, th this would have catch your attention more than other photographs I might have chosen. But it's, it's, so automotive software is so much in the news that it's hard sometimes even for me to remember that us boomer type people grew up driving cars and learning how to drive cars that didn't have any code in them whatsoever. And um, that started to change by the time I was an undergrad, uh, when in the late 70s, uh, microprocessor was first, control was first introduced for spark timing and air fuel ratio control. And the IEEE Spectrum published a special issue that year on the automobile and the future of electronics in the automobile. And if you just want some humorous light reading. This makes for like really, some of these predictions make for really humorous light reading, okay? Uh, they're pretty fun. Uh, but one of the things they pointed out was a potential obstacle to this whole thing was the inability of electrical engineers to explain mechanical systems to microprocessor programmers. So keep that quote in mind because you'll hear it later. Now, that obstacle didn't prevent the software from being developed. Um, I kind of stole this slide from a talk at the CDC by Manfred Marari a few years ago. There's the lines of software in Ford vehicles um, versus time up to about 2010, and you'll see there's more software in a car than there is in a Boeing 787. Um, I couldn't find a more up-to-date version of the software, but here's a, a more recent one on the automotive electronics, which is all controlled by software. 
as a percentage of TAR's total cost, and we see now it's up to 35%, and in 10 years it's supposed to be up to 50%. So lots of software, lots of electronics, and about halfway between the, halfway through this process from the late 70s up until now, 20 years ago, I was approached by Dr. Ken Butts, who at that time was working for uh, Jeff Cook at um, Ford Motor Company, and he'd done his PhD at Michigan with me and Jesse, and he was working on advanced technology powertrain control. And this is the point in time where the amount of all the mechanical linkages on an engine were being replaced by software controlled electronics. And the complexity of the software was just exploding. It was becoming unmanageable. So Ken was actually no longer developing powertrain control systems. He was developing methodologies for powertrain control systems. Uh, 1998 was the year he helped found the MathWorks Automotive Advisory Board to give advice to the MathWorks to make their tools more relevant to the automotive industry. And later on, he became the Ford PI on a DARPA Mobis project that I mentioned because it was actually headquartered here at Berkeley. Um, and Ken asked me, why can't I hire students trained to do embedded control software development? And why don't the students I do hire know how to talk to one another? Well, that goes back to that thing that the IEEE Spectrum pointed out. So I explained to Ken, well, the reason, you've, the reason for that is we keep those two our curriculum keeps those two sets of students as far apart as possible. Okay, we're really proud of it. And he said, Jim, that's a problem. And so we decided to develop a class. And it's complicated because you need control algorithms, software, hardware, electronics, some mechanical engineering stuff. I mean, there's no one student that ever comes through the curriculum and gets all that. Um, so Ken came over with some of his people and um, um, to Michigan and um, for a day, and we made a couple of decisions. We decided that a class should have sort of two-thirds C programming and one-third auto code generation, auto code generation because that enables model-based development and rapid prototyping and all that stuff, but it hides way too much stuff for the students, so two-thirds C programming so they know what goes on underneath the hood, as it were, and then there was, at the time, they were doing development work at Ford on a Motorola MPC 555 microprocessor. It was, I don't know if it was the first, it was certainly one of the first automotive microprocessors for which there were floating point units and C compilers. Uh, earlier, they'd all been programmed in assembly. And Noah Cowan, who was a PhD student working for Dan Kodacek, uh, Dan let me borrow him to um, begin doing development work. Uh, we weren't going to let students uh, do microprocessor control of V8 engines in the lab across the hall from my office. So uh, Brent Gillespie joined the faculty and uh, Noah connected me to him and we decided to use his haptic interfaces uh, to be the vehicle for which the students would, would learn. And we created not just one but two courses, the one at Michigan. We teach about 200 students a year now. Uh, and Jeff Cook teaches it during the semesters when I'm doing something else. Uh, I have to restrict it to double E and computer engineering students, but when I do have space, I permit graduate students to enter from other departments. Um, it's, got, I don't know what, about 113 students registered for next semester. That's one over capacity and 20 or 30 students on the wait list. So it, I have to control that. Um, at some point, Lino Gazella uh, from ATH um, told me to give a talk on this class, and he said, Jim, what do I have to do to get this class at ATH? And I said, well, you know, this costs this much and this costs that much. And I don't care what it costs, but we need you guys to come over here and teach this class, okay? So Jeff came over and um, taught it once, and I've been teaching it in 11 years since then. Um, of course, Lino spends the money, but Somebody else, that's Mary Ann over there that does the work. And, uh, and she's still at ATH and she's still helping out with the class. And those guys are almost all mechanical engineering graduate students. Uh, enrollment versus time, you see it started off slow and then it sort of looks like a couple of those other curves I uh, showed. I'm not suggesting that there's any causality there, but there's certainly some correlation, I think. Um, the lab, uh, we just, we're really proud, we just 
started using um, a new microprocessor from NXP. It's an automotive industry state-of-the-art microcontroller. It's not particularly easy to use. It's not a hobbyist processor, but um, that's good. We're happy it's not a hobbyist processor. It's industrial strength processor. And we've got a new development environment. Um, and we use the haptic interface and the rapid prototyping tools from the MathWorks. Um, this is the first time we're using an ARM-based processor. That really doesn't matter for us. The previous ones were all PowerPC. And it is the fourth generation. And the names of the companies keep changing, but uh, the group is, of people that we work with is the same, Patrick Minter and, um, and his team there, who are now at NXP. The other thing I might add um, is back at this point, there really wasn't a whole lot of um, stuff to help you create a class like this. Uh, Phil Koopman at Carnegie Mellon had a class, and I stole some overhead slides from him that he had on his web page. And Dave Auslander had some real, from Berkeley had some really, really useful books. But other than that, you're just kind of on your own. OK. And there's our evolution of our haptic wheel. And this is actually important to what comes later. Um, our first generation of haptic wheel had a motor that wasn't very powerful, so we had to gear it up with this kind of cheesy little plastic belt in order to get enough torque. Our second generation, we had a direct drive. We got rid of the belt, but we had this really awkward box of electronics that, with a switching amplifier that had a dead zone in it that made it really difficult to analyze what its effect would be um, on some technical things. Now, Lino Gazella, OK, those two things were designed by students uh, working for free pizza. Lino uh, hired Swiss engineers working for Swiss francs. That's a $900 Maxon motor with matched power amplifier. Um, and we moved over to their design, to the, their design, a modification of their design, because the, the sort of the homegrown designs, as the course began to scale up, didn't, didn't support all the use. Yeah. OK, the input is for a, um, they're, they're to be used as haptic wheels. They're going to control uh, computer algorithms that mimic uh, mechanical systems. So the example I'll talk most about uh, in a couple slides from now is we'll connect the haptic wheel up to a virtual wheel with a virtual spring. So you turn the um, haptic wheel and hold it. It'll set the virtual spring in motion. The, it satisfies the equations of a harmonic oscillator, so you'll feel an oscillatory reaction torque at a specified frequency and, um, and amplitude. And that's not the only virtual world we program up, but that's, that's one of the ones that we, um, that we spend a lot of time on. Is that OK? Um, does anybody see the design flaw in the, in the ATEHA design? OK, that $900 Maxon motor is really pretty heavy. It's mounted at one end of a thin piece of aluminum that's attached with a couple of screws to another uh, thin piece of aluminum. It's like a really heavy object mounted at one end of a cantilever. Um, it doesn't matter over here because we only use these two weeks out of a year. But at Michigan, we use them sometimes as many as 10 months out of the year. Uh, so Brent made a somewhat less elegant looking design, but it doesn't have that stability issue. OK. So our lab exercises, we learn all the peripherals on the processor uh, and illustrating signals and systems concepts. I'm not going to talk much about that, but I could do that offline if you want. Um, the first seven labs are in C. Uh, lab eight is autocode generation. And each lab reuses the concepts and code from the previous labs. And this contributes a lot to student satisfaction because they don't just do a lab exercise and then throw it away and forget about it. They reuse it over and over and over again. So everything, all the learning builds upon itself. So by the end of the semester, they've created something really pretty elaborate. And, um, and they've, they know all the steps along the way. <clears throat> 
Um, so I mentioned this already. Um, one of our virtual systems is a virtual wheel. Uh, so this is a haptic wheel, a virtual spring, a virtual inertia. What you want to do is turn the haptic wheel, set this in motion, and the, have the virtual wheel satisfy the differential equation of a harmonic oscillator. And of course, you have to um, um, numerically integrate that. Yeah. Um, for the electrical and computer engineering students, they take a sophomore um, largely analog signals and systems class. And for the graduate students, I just let them in. Um, and they come in from, I've had civil engineering students take it, they do fine. Wait, so you're teaching the material in the lectures associated with these lectures? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I didn't leave a, I didn't make a slide for that, but yeah. So the lectures, we cover, um, you know, linear filtering, sampling and aliasing, quantization, um, hex arithmetic, because depending on your background, you may not know hex arithmetic, um, numerical integration techniques, we, you know, a little bit of microprocessor architecture. Um, and then we move into a um, more computery list of topics. We teach CAN networking is a really big part of the class, so we talk a lot about CAN networking. We talk about uh, real-time operating, interrupts real-time operating systems, software architecture, uh, deadlock, and, you know, all the problems you can get into with, um, um, with semaphores and um, um, real-time operating systems. We talk about um, rate monotonic scheduling theory, and right at the end we even do some PID control, because they'll use that in a final exercise I haven't discussed yet. So. For the current microprocessor, we don't have an RTOS. It's not that RTOSs don't exist, it's just that they're company proprietary or something like that, we don't have access to it. Now, the um, MathWorks, when you, when you don't have a real-time operating system and you want to do something, um, well, I'll talk about it in a couple of slides, um, they have a way of doing something that's functionally equivalent, I'll, I'll mention it in a moment. Um, now, so we have them because they have a model, and eventually we want to do model-based um, control. Um, so they have them set up a Simulink diagram. So by the way, all the students coming in know MATLAB. Some of them know Sim Simulink. None of them know state flow. That's changing a little bit. Uh, so we have to teach all that in homework exercises uh, because they're going to use it all in the lab at some point. So we have them choose the parameters so we get a one hertz virtual oscillation and a maximum torque in response to a 45 degree step of 800 newton millimeters. And we make sure that it, the Simulink model verifies that. Because in a couple labs from now, they're going to be turning the Simulink model into C code. Right now, they're just using it for verification. Now, when they implement that, they have to implement it in real time. So we use forward Euler integration because you can program that at real time. You can't program trapezoidal and things like that in real time because the output of the integrator depends instantaneously on the input to the integrator. Um, but it's numerically unstable. So there are numerically stable integration routines that you can implement in real time, but uh, one of the early TAs for the class, David Thorsley, who happened to be one of Demos Tenniketsis' PhD students, says, oh, well, why don't we just add some damping to the virtual model and you can do some calculations. Mark would have done that when he took this class over in Zurich. And you can do some calculation, you know, solve some eigenvalues, do a quadratic equation, and find out that if you add damping B equals KT, that exactly yields discrete poles on the unit circle. And so, you know, I like to rub that in students' face, because see here, here's some math, and here it works. And if you know the math, it works. If you don't know the math, it doesn't work. And um, they're impressed by that. Okay, then we do a uh, control, um, a CAN networking um, um, exercise where we, you know, we do uh, CAN bus utilization and estimate the effects of uh, delay and things like that. Talk quite a lot about CAN, actually. Um, and then we introduce auto code generation using the MathWorks tools, and we do that to enable rapid prototyping. And 
One of the things that's changed in the 20 years is that there wasn't really much auto code in production in the automotive industry 20 years ago. There was in the aerospace industry, but now um, it's pretty widely used for all sorts of, even for powertrain control systems and safety control systems. Now, there's still a lot of C code. Uh, we had a guy from who does this at Ford and talked to the class a couple weeks ago, and he still does both, but the coverage of um, auto code is um, better. It's and that largely has to do with the fact that the tools have improved, um, you know, due, I guess, to Ken's advisory board committee to generate much more efficient and well-structured code. Um, one of the things we want to do is multitasking because a lot of embedded software needs to be separated into different subroutines that are integrated at different rates. And so with, an art, with a real-time operating system, you use it as separate task states. Without an operating system, um, MATLAB has something called pseudo multitasking where you have the, implement the same function, well, for our purposes, the same functionality with overlapping interrupt routines. And so we talk about how that works. And so here's the, you need simulating blocks that enable you to do all the initialization of the processor that you were doing and hand code with, by hand coding in C. And we get these from, um, um, NXP, that's what a couple of them look like. Um, and then what we do in Lab 8 is we take um, and connect the haptic wheel, not just to one virtual wheel, but to two virtual wheels. And one of them has a 1 hertz natural frequency, one of them has a 10 hertz natural frequency, and then we implement those two at, with different update rates. It's not really necessary, but it it, it works for the purpose of explaining how to implement things at different update rates. So if you turn the wheel and hold it, set the virtual wheels in motion, you should feel a 10 hertz oscillation imposed upon a 1 hertz oscillation. So the, the two are connected to each other by a virtual switch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually haven't. Sometimes people ask me just exactly how that would be in practice, and well, since they're virtual, I don't have to worry about it, right? So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's what the top level looks like. There's the uh, processor initialization block, the fast dynamics are in the red block, the slow dynamics in the slow block, and these things are called rate transition blocks, which handle the passing of data back and forth between the, the two subsystems implemented at different rates in such a way that ensures data integrity and deterministic data transfer. And then you see one virtual wheel implemented inside each of the fast and slow subsystems. And inside the fast subsystem, we are reading the encoder and writing out to the PWM signal to drive the motor. Okay, and then we have them do, we don't do this in, in Zurich, we do it at um, U of M. We, imp we give them a, dr a driving simulator that was um, written by a PhD student working with Brent Gillespie. Paul Griffiths, who had actually learned how to use the Motorola MPC 555 while he was a master's student at Berkeley on a project with uh, Carl Hedrick. Um, so another Berkeley connection. And so um, we have the haptic wheel drive a bicycle model of a car with um, torque feedback that models the road tire interaction. And um, we have them... Um, exchange their positions along a virtual road over the CAN bus, and then they have an adaptive cruise control algorithm that can either be in one of three modes, a manual where you control the speed with a potentiometer, uh, constant speed control like con conventional cruise control, or constant distance following control. If you get too close to the car in front of you, you switch modes. Now, 20 years ago, uh, you couldn't get a car that had that on it, and now it's kind of fairly standard on high-end cars. Uh, we also have them uh, do a tune a P PD controller to do uh, lane centering, so the car will drive itself down the middle of the road. And so are the students holding onto the, the actual haptic wheel? And if that's not, the the yeah, 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 okay. yeah. So up until up until here, and here they, here they don't have to anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they have to hold on to it, and they would never be able to do this in three weeks if they were hand coding in C because the, the underlying simulink diagram is actually pretty complex. And, um, and we don't specify a lot of how they do this, so different people 
you know, some people prefer to write something called an S function and just stick C code in a simulink block. Some people prefer to do it all in simulink. Some people, well, they might, that state flow block is complicated enough you really couldn't do it in simulink, uh, but they see how all that, all that stuff works. Um, okay, so they're exchanging their positions over the CAN bus, and so you sort, you sort out how, which, which car is cl closest to you in front, and if it's um, above a threshold, you just go along at a constant speed, but if it's below that threshold, you track it at a specified following distance. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So this is the end of the first part of the talk. Um, I knew when I started that this class would end up being very multidisciplinary. I didn't quite appreciate the extent to which we would be working at multiple layers of, layers of abstraction because our early labs, which I didn't talk about, were actually getting down into registers and fiddling around with bits in a register and doing like really, really low level stuff. And by the end, I mean, we're doing some pretty high level state flow modeling, network control kinds of things. Um, I've learned that successful embedded engineers understand time and mechanical engineers and electrical engineers are good at this because they understand time in the application domain because they know differential equations. They can come up with a model, figure out the time constants and come up with an upper bound on sample period. Okay. Computer engineers understand time on the microprocessor. Ones and zeros don't switch, don't change back and forth automatically and you know we have them time A to D conversions, we have them time everything we can think of to have them time, and there's all these little bits and pieces of nanoseconds and microseconds, they all add up. They provide a lower bound on what sample rate can be. And you hope there's a gap. Okay, so this is the part that you teach in a traditional digital control class. That's the part that gets taught in a traditional embedded systems class. They don't do both together in the same class. And of course, the, um, the um, I motivated all this with automotive, but the students go off and work in all kinds of different industries, and there's plenty of them out here in the Bay Area working for Elon Musk's companies uh, for some reason. Now, there's an issue that arises in the lab, though. Remember I say um, turn the virtual wheel, to, or turn the haptic wheel to set the virtual wheel in motion by, you know, turning it and holding it? Well, to analyze that, we model that as a step input, solve the differential equation. We see that the motion of the virtual wheel um, is a you know, cosine with the specified natural frequency. And so in lab eight, uh, we're using one in 10 hertz wheels and students don't feel the 10 hertz oscillation. And originally that didn't worry me because our first haptic wheel had that crazy little chain in it. I figured the 10 hertz oscillations were getting damped out. Second generation of haptic wheel had this crazy PWM amplifier that, with this dead zone in it that we never could analyze. It didn't really worry me. But when I started teaching the class over in Zurich, well, you, you saw their hardware. I mean, that really worried me that we couldn't feel the, I couldn't feel the 10 hertz oscillation. I couldn't blame it on the hardware anymore. I blamed it on how they were setting up their simulink. I thought maybe they were inadvertently sampling at the slow rate instead of the fast rate. But that's not true. Yeah? Are those people that didn't feel the 10 hertz able to feel it if you directly let them control the mechanical system without any computer in between? Is it maybe something that not everybody is really trained to, in a rotatory sense, find you know, a higher frequency superimposed on a lower frequency? So it's not something you typically encounter in every day. Uh, well, eventually, about three sides from now, uh, I'll show you how we do that, okay? So one of the TAs back at uh, Michigan, Ye Fei, pointed out that, you know, Jim, you model this as a step in, turning this wheel and holding it as a step input, but, you know, it takes about a quarter second to turn the wheel 45 degrees. We're sampling at a two millisecond rate. Uh, the input that the virtual wheel actually sees looks a little bit more like this kind of like a ramp function that saturates. Now, the corners would be rounded in real, real life, but um, so what you can do is you can subtract two ramp functions, uh, solve the differential equation, find that you get 
after a transient, you get oscillations at the desired frequency of amplitude determined by a coefficient uh, whose value at 1 hertz is 0.9 and at 10 hertz is about 0.1. So um, 1 hertz oscillations, uh, 10 hertz oscillations, really small. That's not the only way in which I misled the students. Um, after you turn the wheel, uh, if it were really a step input, it, it would be constant, it wouldn't move. But there's a reaction torque. So it moves a little bit. So it's not really a second order dynamical system, it's a fourth order dynamical system. And so it looks something more like this, where U is whatever the operation of the um, human is on controlling the wheel, and I say, well, you know anything about controlling, turning the wheel, all well, this? Yeah, that's a PD control law, okay? And you can figure out PD co coefficients that will get you there in about a quarter second and with a little overshoot. And, and then if you are a PhD student, Bo, you know, he says, well, look, let's look at the total energy of the system evaluated along these trajectories, and the total energy decreases um, unless you're holding the haptic wheel completely motionless. So the oscillations decay. I didn't show plots of that, but it turns out um, they decay a lot more rapidly at 10 hertz than they do at 1 hertz. So Brent says, Brent hates that PD control thing. He says, no, 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 Jim. What you have to do is model the human impedance the impedance of the, you know, the human, you know, the hand grasping the wheel and the motor and everything like that. And I mean, the equation is the same, okay, but um, um, the coefficients have a different interpretation. And Bo got in the lab and did some system identification. And um, um, when you do the simulations, um, you see that the, this is the, the motion of the uh, virtual wheel. And you see the, os it, you know, they, the phase, it gets out of phase, but the qualitative uh, behavior of the oscillations is the same. They decay. And that's all we were really trying to get was sort of the qual same qualitative behavior because that simple model leaves us too much out. And then Bo, I'm not going to talk about it today. Bo went on and studied that a lot in his PhD dissertation, and he wanted to study how human impedance uh, varies with grip force, so he outfitted load cells onto a haptic wheel and did a whole bunch of um, work on that. Um, only in the context of feed-forward control, not in terms of feedback control. Uh, but the point I want you to get out of this is human impedance varies with grip force, because that'll be important later. Now, how to feel a 10 hertz oscillation? Well, there's, we actually ask students to do this three different ways. One is to give up and implement a 1 hertz and a 0.1 hertz virtual wheel. That should work really, really well, except all these kids grew up with smartphones, and none of them has a 10-second attention span. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't know. One of the TAs in Zurich suggested just use a little reaction torque. And you can adjust, you know, the reaction torque down to a level that's low enough that you can, that you can keep the oscillation sustained, but still high enough that you can feel. Alternately, you could go to the gym and work out for a few weeks. Take the Arnold Schwarzenegger approach and hold the thing. And what works really, really well, since we're doing auto code generation with Simulink, just put in a Simulink block that says, if the encoder is reading the haptic wheel angle to be less than 45 degrees, set it equal to zero degrees. If it's greater than 45 degrees, set it equal to 45 degrees. Students turn the wheel to, say, 60 degrees. Doesn't matter that they can't hold it exactly. The virtual wheel is seeing the step input, and the human is feeling, and you can feel the one in the 10 hertz oscillations really well. Because you've, um, it's the feedback through the human that's dampening out the, the virtual oscillations. And with this in there, yeah, you, well, I've, I've disconnected the coupling. Uh, the, the coupling is still going back to the human, but it's no longer going forward to the virtual wheel. Yeah, 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 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now there's a fourth alternative, and we don't have students doing this, but um, uh, sometimes they try it. And you think, well, look, you know, if what you really want to do is feel a 10 hertz oscillation, why don't you just, instead of trying to hold the haptic wheel motionless, why don't you try to pump it, pump energy into the virtual system and keep the oscillation sustained? Well, what do you have to do in order to do that? Well, you have to somehow come up with a model in your head of what you want this virtual oscillation to be because you have to sync up with it because if you're not in phase with it, you'll continue to dampen the oscillation. So you have to model the virtual oscillation and there's something in control uh, theory that called the internal model principle that studies how humans uh, track um, persistent signals or reject persistent disturbances and they say in, in you know, Francis and Wanham's papers in the 70s say that uh, if you want to do that robustly it's necessary to contain a copy of the signal dynamics. So if the signal you want to track is a step you have to put an integrator in your controller. If it's a um, sinusoid, like, then you put a harmonic oscillator in your controller. It's used in the disk drive industry. Okay, and so we wondered, you know, maybe that's what the human is actually doing because everybody knows that humans are really good at modeling things they're trying to. Well, people argue over the extent to which humans are good at modeling things they're trying to do, but maybe they're, uh, you know, trying to do internal model principle control, and. I'm going over this for the sake of any biomechanics people that have to be in the audience, happen to be in the audience. Uh, remember the way this works is the error signal in the feedback loop in response to these two inputs is described by the sensitivity function. Uh, an internal model principle controller is going to have a couple of poles at the frequency of the inputs. So the sensitivity function will have zeros at those poles. Uh, closed loop stability implies that the steady state error signal is going to be proportional to the sensitivity function evaluated at the frequency of the sinusoidal input, and that's going to be zero. And if you don't believe that, um, or you don't want to think about the math, just think about the fact that we know that the steady state response of a stable linear system to sinusoidal input is a sinusoid at the frequency of the input. That means the error signal is going to sinusoid at frequency omega naught, but the controller is a harmonic oscillator at frequency omega naught. If you drive a harmonic oscillator at its resonant frequency, its response is going to go unbounded. That can't happen because the feedback system is stable. Therefore, the amplitude of the input is going to zero. I've spent a lot of time trying to explain this to biomechanics people. <laughs> okay. Now, in, because in, in the human motor control literature, which is huge, uh, there's lots and lots and lots of talk of uh, both feedback and feed forward control. Um, and a lot of this literature, the controller um, falls into one of two categories. There's inverse models where the controller is inverting or partly inverting the plant dynamics, whether it's in or outside a feedback loop, and forward models where there's um, a model of the control signal or the, of, the, of the plant in parallel. And these are really common in the control literature too. I mean, Manfred Morari wrote a whole book on internal model control, uh, which looks at structures like that. But the point is, is that these controllers contain models of the system to be controlled, not the task to be performed, the disturbance to be rejected, or the reference to be tracked. So the model in the controller models G in one way or another. It doesn't model D or R. And there's probably somebody looking this up on Google right now. And you'll get to a Wikipedia page on human motor control. And it explains it incorrectly. So um, I mean, remember the reason biomechanics people don't understand this. Um, I thought maybe I was just missing it, but it, there was a special session on internal model principle at CDC last year. Murray Wanham gave a talk, but there was a gentleman named Michiotti, who I actually don't know, but gave a talk on internal model principles in, the neuro, in neuroscience. And he starts off by saying, internal model principle isn't much used in neuroscience. So he talked about these two things for the next 20 minutes. So it really isn't um, 
And we talked to Sam Burden, who was a student here at Berkeley before he became a professor at Washington. He was in Michigan a few weeks ago, and he agrees. OK, I promise this is going to tie together, OK? There's Noah Cowan um, does a lot of work with, um, with animals in one form or another. And he did a whole bunch of studies of something called a weakly electric knife fish. And this is a fish that has a property that it can swim forwards and backwards easily well. And it has, in addition to vision sensors, it has electrosensory perceptors, and it likes to hide. And if you're in a fish tank in an aquarium, it hides in a piece of PVC pipe. And what Noah and some of his colleagues at Johns Hopkins observed was that if you move this thing that's called a refuge back and forth, the fish can track it. And it can track it with like almost no tracking error. It's not following it with a phase lag. It's keeping up with it. And they studied that and discovered that the extent to which that works depends upon whether the refuge motion is predictable or unpredictable. If the refuge motion is just a sinusoid, um, it does it pretty well. If it's a sum of sinusoids, you add a few sinusoids together real quickly. That looks really, really complicated. Uh, you can't really predict what's going to happen next. And the, you still follow the refuge motion, but you don't do it sort of instantaneously. You do it with a phase lag. Okay. What if it's a clean square wave? Uh, I don't know if you ever tried that or not. Um, so the. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know the history behind it. I, I'd have to ask Noah. I, I, I don't know how that came about. Um, but Noah, in his paper, these, you know, these experimental biology journals are really interesting to me because they're very, they're not at all like our control journals, uh, where there's theorems and proofs and things. I mean, the experimental biology is you you sort of explain what you want to do, and then you explain the experimental setup in excruciating detail and how you collect it and analyze the data in excruciating detail. And then you get three or four pages at the end where you can just speculate wildly. And, um, and Noah points out that maybe the controller is a common filter that includes a dynamical model of the refuge motion in addition to the dynamics of the fish. In other words, suppose it's an internal model principle controller. Now, he never actually says that. But if you read, I mean, it, you know, I mean, he took a class from me where I talked about internal model principle controllers. So, you know, I don't know. Um, now, Brent and I got to wondering if you could do the same thing with people. And so here we used the, hap the wheel, but we turned off the haptic feedback. And we used it to track a reference. That's, just, that's this little red thing with a cursor on a screen. And we let the cursor either go back and forth with sinusoidal motion or with this crazy sum of sinus motion. And we saw exactly the same thing. Um, you could do really good tracking uh, for the predictable motion, but not the unpredictable motion. Now, we never got uh, far enough along with our, um, we never thought much about it after we got those plots and our student graduated. So um, um, we didn't do much more with it. Uh, so let's go back to, what Noah said, and something that's pretty common to teach in um, graduate controls classes is um, disturbance estimation. So the idea is you have a disturbance coming into the system. And if you have a model of the disturbance, say if it's a step disturbance, it's the response of an unforced integrator, uh, you can put those dynamics in your estimator, estimate the disturbance, and then cancel, cancel it out. And I, I, what I taught Noah was doing it for steps, but you can equally well do it for sinusoidal disturbances. Now, in this particular topology, um, you still have to modify the reference signal uh, with some precompensation that depends on the plant. You don't want to do that. So you um, can redraw the block diagram, put the reference in, in, in a different location, and now you've got um, a controller that 
is good both for tracking sinusoids and rejecting steps. And you don't have to design it using that common filter methodology, just anything with that um, oscillatory dynamics in there will do it. Okay, so let's go back to our model for lab six. Um, this blue line separates the code from the stuff that exists in the real world, and that's the link that we cut to break that feedback loop that kills the, um, the, the virtual oscillation. If you look at transfer functions associated with this, um, you'll notice that the transfer function from, okay, so what this represents, theta r is an input that represents human intent, like the human intends to turn the wheel and hold it, something like that. It's, it's, it's kind of like what you want to do in your head. Okay, and the transfer function from that to the um, position of the haptic wheel has a big zero in it at the natural frequency of the, uh, the virtual oscillator. Well, it has to because this is an inherently stable system and that's an oscillator and uh, you can't drive it at its natural frequency um, or the response will blow up. So the input has to go to zero. Yeah? How do you know what the human input is? Um, well, I did some simulations a few, um, few slides ago where the human intent was like this, that saturated ramp thing only with rounded corners, meaning the human intends to, you know, move the wheel and, and hold it. And it's a little more realistic of what a human can do than doing it instantaneously. Okay, and so I call this the open loop response. It's not really an open loop response because there's feedback in it, but it's open loop in the sense that I'm not trying to force um, the haptic wheel, or the, excuse me, the virtual wheel to, to track anything. And so the torque applied by the human is this thing, and if the human intent is you intend the virtual wheel to exhibit this sinusoidal motion at the natural frequency, then you see that the, indeed, the uh, motion of the haptic wheel goes to zero, and what the human is doing is sitting there and just tensing and untensing in sync with the feedback it's getting from the haptic wheel, just to cancel that out and to keep it motionless, okay? Now, you can't specify the amplitude or phase of the virtual oscillations. Uh, to do that, you could try an actual internal model principle controller where you're feeding back, um, well, we don't have, the only thing you're feeding, we don't have visual sensors in this yet, um, so the only feedback, so what this slide represents is using the information in the um, haptic feedback to form an error control loop so that you feed that into your internal model principle controller and then you get the desired tracking. Once again, all the human being is doing is kind of tensing up. Yeah? Um, well, see, I don't think I have a movie of this. I mean, probably, I mean, I've already made derogatory comments about the attention spans of millennials, so yeah, probably. Um, and they can't keep the, in, in reality, they can't keep the wheel motionless anyway. I mean, it moves a little bit just because they're not good enough at it. And I think our, uh, I'll, show a sim I'll show some experimental data in a couple of slides, and we'll look and see how, how many seconds that went. It, lasted because I don't remember. Okay. And so just at a high level, the architecture looks like this. There's a one oscillator in the internal model principle controller, one oscillator in the virtual wheel dynamics, and closed-up stability implies both that signal has to go to zero and that signal has to go to zero. Okay. So the answer to your question is, that was 120 seconds, okay? And um, so 
what they did here. This didn't, this is, this doesn't implement the internal model principle loop. This is like that open loop thing. So what we're trying to do is just get sustained oscillations of the virtual wheel, but not control its amplitude or phase. And so the first strategy is you just, so what subjects are asked to do is to set the virtual wheel in motion by turning the haptic wheel and then turning it back to zero and, and holding it. And if you sort of ho are holding it loosely at zero, uh, the oscillations die out. And you see this small um, EMG signal um, because you're not really trying to do anything. Um, I don't know, Brent for some reason calls the next strategy co-contract. But this is when you're really trying to increase the human impedance by really grabbing on to the virtual wheel hard. And you see the oscillations die out much more slowly, but they do die out. And then in the last strategy, all you're trying to do is keep the wheel motionless by, by periodically um, trying to counter that reaction torque. And you see the oscillations, the oscillations are sustained. And you see, I mean, the humans don't do this perfectly, um, but you see these these EMP, EMG signals are in sync with the, uh, with the virtual wheel oscillations and the um, torque feedback that they, that they cause. Um, one of the things that NOAA is very interested in is the effect of time delays in these systems. And if you, one of the thing, interesting things about these internal model principle controllers is that they're robust to the effect of time delays in the forward path. And not in the feedback path, but in the forward path. And that's important because there are a lot of sensory motor delays in the human nervous system. Um, there's a lot of literature on haptic versus visual feedback, and nobody really apparently agrees on what the relative merits of the two sensing modalities are. Um, NOAA has studied this in the context of juggling. Um, and in juggling, haptic, okay, so haptic feedback always conveys both power and information. Uh, but in juggling, it really doesn't affect the dynamics very much because you're only getting haptic feedback at discrete instants of time. It's useful, but it's more a timing cue rather than it is anything else. Uh, Brent, with Art Quo, back when he was still at Michigan, um, did something they called object manipulation where they um, excited a mechanical resonance. And this was actually a virtual mechanical resonance. And so the haptic feedback was continuous and they, um, I don't know, they made some conclusions about it, but neither one of these papers actually tried to model um, the power flow in that, in that haptic feedback and how it changed the dynamics. To my way of thinking, now that I have a model of this, um, if I added um, some graphics so I could see the virtual wheel, uh, this looks like, to me, like an ideal situation for inner loop, outer loop control. A fast inner loop around torque, because that has high frequency gain, and then a slow outer loop uh, for steady state regulation around the um, um, haptic wheel. Um, the visual haptic wheel. Now, we haven't done anything with this. That's just me speculating. Um, comparing haptic and visual feedback is pretty complicated because of this fact that haptic feedback changes the dynamics. What you'd like to do is you'd like to turn one sensor off and then turn the other sensor on and then just go back and forth. But you can't do that because you change the game. And so um, Brent has this idea of coming up with something called a virtual hand that models in software the uh, effect of the haptic feedback on the, the, on, the wheel, on the hand wheel system. And then the actual um, human would be controlling a haptic wheel, but the haptic wheel position would be used as an input to this virtual thing. The haptic wheel position is basically becomes that thing called theta r. And in this scenario, these dynamics are the, you haven't changed the dynamics. The dynamics are the same whether or not the actual human is experiencing haptic feedback. 
and you can switch the two back and forth. And, uh, and we've done some sort of preliminary um, uh, studies on that, but that's still a work in progress. Um, yeah, except we haven't done that yet. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's, that's a slide I made um, a long time ago, and we haven't actually done those experiments. We haven't been doing these experiments for very long because the proposal is pretty new. So we want to do something like that. And so this would, um, I don't know, I'm not even sure Noah buys into this whole thing, but um, it, it, it's one of the things that we're, we're thinking about. And one of the things that I like about this project is um, part of our stuff is code. It's virtual. It's in software. Part of it is physiological and physical, like a mechanical. And part of it, this thing involving human intent and human control is all in your, in your head somehow. And I, I don't know. That's a pretty big agenda to try to model that. Our actual proposal, which we barely started working on yet, is to determine in, how, which internal models best capture uh, human motor control behavior, which of course depends upon the task you achieve. And that's some of the things that we've started doing experiments on. Um, we're going to work to see, whenever we figure out how we think healthy humans um, use internal models, we're going to do some experiments. This will be done at the Kennedy Krieger Institute by Amy Pastian um, in subjects that are, have cerebellar damage, cerebellar a taxi, they call it, because we figure they won't be able to model, do the modeling that well. And then we'll try to exploit the models of motor control to design better coupled human machine systems. And Brent's had a lot of experience doing that uh, with shared control of automotive steering with some research grants from Ford. And Amy and Noah had experiments doing uh, developing better um, interfaces for rehabilitation for uh, the cerebellar patients. So. Uh, that's all. I, um, I guess I'm a little bit over time. Um, you know, if you play a piece of music, you're supposed to begin with by stating the theme, and then you do variations or improvisations, and then you're expected to come back to the theme. And I haven't talked about automotive software in a long time. So, my first car was a 1965 Ford Galaxy 500. Not that one; it was a different color, but you get the idea. And it had no power, or anything. You opened the hood. There was nothing but empty space and a 289 V6 engine and not a single line of software. Okay, so thank you. What, what I, that's a good point, and I, for, I actually forgot to mention that um, because the first thing, it doesn't matter if it's a human or that fish, the first thing that the animal has to do is figure out the frequency, and that would be a nonlinear adaptation that, at least in healthy people, seems to happen so fast that uh, we've never really studied it. Uh, that people seem to latch onto that really, really quickly. And I don't know whether the cerebellar patients will or not, but it's, it, I mean, yeah, we know that that's something that's interesting, but it's, it, it seems to happen pretty seamlessly, at least for, even for that fish. Yeah, along those lines, I think that practically every human, when you let them hang a pendulum, mm -hmm. and they figure out very quickly what they have to do to put maximum power and make the pendulum stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, we've thought about like digging into the you know, adaptive signal processing literature and adaptive, blah, but it, it just it hasn't been a problem. So you know, we've focused our attention elsewhere. 
cerebellum uh, uh, patients have trouble, then that would be very interesting to understand what exactly goes wrong there if they're unable to travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know, and we, and we haven't started doing that work yet. Thank you. Okay.